and for this evening's gospel reading, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 and 16 through 21. Beware of your practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received your reward. But when you give them alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen. Truly, I tell, it, tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on the earth, where moth and rust consume and where the thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Lately, I've been asking people to spontaneously stand up and extemporaneously pray for me before I preach, or sometimes people write it out. But this evening, Jackie Stranathan, our new coordinator of ministries with children, is going to offer the prayer this evening. Christ, you show us the path to choose, the practice of justice and compassion. Teach us to follow him in truth and grace, receiving our reward with your saints in glory. Tonight, as we begin our Lent journey, be with Pastor Terry as she shares with us a meditation. May our hearts be touched, our minds be still, so we can hear, through Christ, treasure of our hearts, we pray. Amen. Amen. Home is where what? The heart is. Do you know who said that? Does anyone know who said that? It's attributed to Pliny the Great, also known as Gaius Plinius Secundus. First century, uh, he died when Vesuvius erupted in Pompeii with everyone else. He was a naval hero and a writer and a philosopher. It made me think about that this evening. Home is where the heart is, because Jesus is talking to his disciples and those gathered around about where your treasure is is where your heart is going to be found. It made me think about home as well, and I looked up some of my favorite quotes on home. I think this is probably my favorite one. Home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Think about that for a moment. Home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Anybody know who said that one? It's in a poem by Robert Frost. Then, um, let's see. This is one of my favorites, Maya Angelou. The ache for home lives in all of us. The safe place where we can go as we are and not be questioned. Think about that for a moment, the place that's safe where you can go without being questioned. Sort of a little bit nicer than Robert Frost's version of when you have to go there, they have to take you in, but it's a similar idea. Then there's the idea of heaven is home. Billy Graham was the one who said, my home is in heaven, I'm just traveling through this world. Now he has arrived in his home, we all know that. And C.S. Lewis said something similar, he said, the fact that our heart yearns for something earth can't supply is proof that heaven must be our home. Listen to that one again. The fact that our heart yearns for something earth cannot supply is proof that heaven must be our home. 
Now, when I look at the lesson that we read tonight, especially the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible reading, yet now says the Lord, return to me with all your heart. But if we're returning to God, we haven't been to heaven yet, have we? If you've been to heaven, raise your hand, because I want to talk to you about your experience later. But I found a quote that I really like from James Baldwin, who was an African-American author and activist. He said, perhaps home is not a place, but simply an irrevocable condition. I want to read that one again. Perhaps home is not a place, but simply an irrevocable condition. Irre irrevocable. I can say it. Irrevocable. Irrevocable. Cannot be revoked. Can't be undone. Something that's permanent. And what if heaven itself is, in this sense we're talking this evening, not a place, but an irrevocable condition? So we're returning to God. We're going to be with God. Not in heaven. We're not talking about heaven. So often people say when someone dies, he's in a better place, to which I say, well, duh, if you think that heaven is real, of course it's better than Cockeysville. Of course it's better than Timonium. It's better probably even than other places, the place you come from, your home, if your home is not Cockeysville, Maryland. But we don't necessarily want to be there yet, do we? Because people said to me when my husband died, he's in a better place, he's in a better place, he's in a better place. When I returned to my Sunday school class at the church I was serving, I was teaching the senior high Sunday school class, and they looked at me like scared rabbits in headlights. I said, you have no idea what to say to me, do you? And they said, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I said, I'll tell you what to say when someone you know is grieving. You say to them, I'm sorry. If you mean it, you say, I love you. And if you really mean it, you say, I'll pray for you. And one boy said, my family prays for you every night, and I knew he was absolutely telling me the truth. And another boy said, you know, when my grandfather died, people said to my grandmother all the time, he's in a better place, he's in a better place, he's in a better place. And he said, it made me angry because I thought, that means it's better than being with his wife that he's loved for 50 years. And I said, that's what it sounds like when you hear it. So what if heaven, what if our home with God is not a real place but an irrevocable condition? I think that's what we're entering into during this Lenten season irrevocable condition of our place with God. Because this is what God says, return to me, says the Lord, with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, rend your hearts and not your clothing. Now that was what Jews did when they were upset. They would tear their clothing. And you know the sound of the clothing makes when it rips, don't you? Unfortunately, some of us have felt it when we bend over sometime, rip. Or how many of you have ever torn a piece of fabric and you hear that, that, sort of a gut-wrenching feeling, is it? And they would tear their clothing with the, ah, yelling out to God. But God doesn't want us to tear our clothing. God wants us to tear our hearts. Then the writer takes over and says, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. Return to me with fasting, with weeping and with mourning. Fasting is part of Lent, isn't it? We're going to read Sunday about Jesus in the wilderness and his 40 days and 40 nights without sustenance in the wilderness, in the, the desert places where it's hot at day and cold at night. We're going to talk about fasting, not necessarily going without food, although that is one way to fast, and that's something some people take on for Lent. We'll talk about different ways to fast, different things that we can give up. Hopefully, some that will give up once and for all. With weeping and with mourning, because this is a time to look inwardly, to look into our own hearts and see the places where we have broken God's heart, where we have torn God's heart, we've disappointed the Lord, and to offer up our sorrow for our sin, our not our penitence, not that we have to make things right, because only God can do that, but to say to God, I'm going to change with your help. What if God would like our hearts to break this Lenten season for other people? I think that's something we can do. We need to pray for one another every day. Pray for your brothers and sisters in this congregation. Pray for the community in which you live. Pray for the young man who decided to take a gun and try to kill himself and then turn it on a police officer. Pray for him. Pray for the police officer he shot. 
Pray for the one who is getting out of the hospital and has months, if not years, of recovery ahead. Pray for those you just don't like very much, because that's when you change. You may not change them, but you will change if you pray for the people who pluck your last nerve. It will change you. I promise you that. Pray for this congregation's ministries to expand. Pray for every child in this community to be fed every day and to know love and acceptance and grace and warmth and peace and comfort and hope. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will also be. So what are we going to treasure this Lenten season? What will be your treasure? Will it be the things you have, the things you eat, the things you used to mollify and codify yourselves? Or will they be the things that last? Will you treasure Christ's presence in your life? Will you treasure what God has done for you in Jesus Christ? Will you treasure your brothers and sisters around you in this congregation and in this community? Will you treasure your own self, precious in God's eyes, remembering that God is slow to anger, merciful and abounding in steadfast love, the God who relents from punishing? Maybe this Lent you'll stop punishing yourself for things you've done or think you may have done. There's an irony to Ash Wednesday, isn't there, when we look at the words of Jesus to his disciples? Beware of practicing your piety before people. When you fast, don't look miserable. Oh, oh, woe is me, I've given up chocolate, I've given up donuts, I've given up whatever little indulgence you may give up. Instead, he says, put oil on your face and shine with the glorious love of God. But here we are tonight coming forward to mark ourselves with ashes. Woe is us. Woe is us. But we're talking about a different kind of return there, aren't we? Returning to the earth from which we were created, remembering that we were made from dust into dust. One day we will go back. Our bodies, but not our souls, not the real part of us that will be with God forever. So tonight, say goodbye to your old self, the parts that need to go. Let them go. Let them be as the ashes in the cup up here. And accept the new life that Christ offers you, which is why in the service every evening of Ash Wednesday or every morning, sometimes I will do a 6 a.m. worship service for those who like to wear their ashes all day. I used to love, my husband loved to watch ESPN. I'd see Tony Reale with his ashes on every, every Ash Wednesday, and people would sort of joke at him and say, so you've been to church, eh, Tony? And I remember a little girl in one of the congregations I served who proudly went at 6 a.m. every Ash Wednesday. I was her pastor to get her ashes. And she'd go to school and her teachers would all say to her, I didn't know you were Catholic. And she'd say, I'm not Catholic, I'm a Christian. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I just got an email from her that she's engaged to a boy she met in church. Ah, yes, sometimes they listen. So in a moment, I'm going to invite you to come forward to take the sign of your repentance, the sign of your contrition, the sign of your heart wanting to be broken for God's purposes, broken from the past. And then we'll come forward again and we will share in the body and blood of Christ, which is our new life, our new identity, our new hope, our new peace, our new joy. Before we do that, we will pause as we always do to confess our sins using the words of King David this time as he repented of his sin with Bathsheba. I want you to listen to the words that we'll say every Sunday during the season of Lent and we will say with joy on Easter Sunday, restore to me the joy of your salvation because Lent as it brings us closer to God will bring us closer to one another, will bring us closer to the peace that we crave, bring us closer to being the people that God has created us to be. So as we come together tonight, remember that we are coming together with hearts that are aching for God because God wants us to come home. God's arms are wide open saying, return to me, return to me to the irrevocable condition of my love for you in Jesus Christ, my son, who willingly gave himself for your sake and the sake of the world. Come to me, return to me, and I will restore the joy of your salvation. This is God's promise. This is my hope. This is my peace. This is my joy. Amen, amen, amen.